the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by Michael Kent. Michael is the founder and CEO of Asimo, a fast-growing money transmission business. Michael first joined us over a year ago in episode 34, and it was fun to connect again this week. As the founder of Asimo, and before that of Small World FS, another money transmission business, Michael is extremely well-placed to talk about the founder's journey. In the second installment of our Founders Session series, we explore the first few months of Asimo, from idea to product to traction, in what I think is a hugely insightful conversation. As always, connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on our website at bankingthefuture.com. If you like today's episode, we'd be genuinely grateful if you'd go to iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, and subscribe and leave us a review. It helps other people find the podcast and is hugely valuable for us. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Michael Kent. Michael Kent, founder and CEO of Asimo. It's great to have you on the podcast again. Thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's been a while. Yeah. So I, I was um, kind of flicking through the back catalog and actually um, uh, listened to our uh, first episode again. It was episode number 34. So early days, 70 plus episodes ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Back in the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be good because, you know, we kind of like told a bit of your, your backstory uh, in, that, in that first episode, um, talked about uh, small world, talked about how you connected with your, your business partner, um, talked about a bit of the, the angel uh, investing that, that you do. Um, and so I, I thought it'd be great today to, um, to, to do another in our uh, Founder Sessions series, which we kicked off recently with Hussein Kasai of, uh, of Onfido, really kind of getting into some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of the early, you know, early, early days of, of Asimo and, and by all means, uh, Small World as well. Um, to to you know to inform some uh, you know thought processes of uh, of of those out there listening who uh, who are involved in early stage ventures of their own or have aspirations to be. Sure, uh, so sounds good. Before we do that, quick refresher for those who uh, who haven't listened to the uh, the the earlier episode or haven't checked it out for a while. Tell us a bit about Asimo. Sure. Um, so Asmo is a mobile enabled cross border payments business. We allow people to send money from Europe, mostly um, to emerging markets. So uh, we have uh, getting on for a couple of million customers now on the send and receive side. And the kind of people that are sending money really varies. But traditionally, they would use something like Western Union or MoneyGram on, on, with high street locations. We're, we're digitizing that whole process. Uh, raising up the customer satisfaction rates and, and then very dramatically dropping the price. And you guys have had a great success in terms of customer numbers and processing volumes and investment raise and all the rest. Any, any updates since we last spoke on uh, how the business is going? Uh, I'm trying to remember where we last spoke. Um, so we, we probably raised more money since then. We, we um, raised a Series C round from Rakuten, which is a big Japanese um, internet and financial services business based out of Japan. But they, they do more and more stuff in Europe and, uh, and America. Uh, yeah, billion, multi-billion dollar corporation. Um, and yeah, we've I guess we've... We're a platform player, so we actually, in terms of the size of the team, hasn't grown um, nearly as fast as the business had. Um, but we're we're constantly trying to upskill. We've opened in a couple of new markets. We're in the process of uh, looking at a couple more. So yeah, I mean things things have been good. Um, it's 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 always up and down. Uh, 
just this morning I went to a breakfast briefing on um, on Brexit and heard what the lawyers or accountants knew about that or what they didn't know actually that was probably the main thing um, so there, you know there's a few challenges but I think they're across the whole fintech sector it's been fun I'm enjoying myself yeah. which is nice excellent well um, yeah so first question and, and maybe maybe it's an interesting place to, to kind of uh, start so you, I guess, for for audience context, came from uh, founding and uh, rather, I, you know, I suppose, another entrepreneurial experience in the FX and uh, and remittances space. Um, so you had some industry insight, uh, some experience, and um, I'd be curious to know how how confident were you in, in the thesis of Asimo uh, when you started spending money on it. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, well, one, I guess I was a repeat entrepreneur, so it was very hard for me to go and get a proper job. Um, and your listeners, probably most of them, uh, either know or should know that it's incredibly hard to go back if you've started down the entrepreneurial path. So um, I knew I had to do something. I think, interestingly, in every business, you think of you know the things that you could do better, um, both in terms of the the type of business you want to build, the type of customers you're going after, the way that you serve them, and also the way that you build and scale your team. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of time in, in America looking at um, this particular market, and I did understand it. I'd been in the market before. Um, and I came across uh, a couple of companies that were, were doing pretty well. One of them um, was Zoom and, and was ultimately acquired by PayPal for, uh, I think, just over a billion dollars. And, and I, could, I could see that that, was the, the, that meshed with my understanding of how consumers were changing and, and using uh, digital technology much more and how also the fintechs or the, the traditional finance sector was responding quite slowly to that. So I was actually pretty sure this was going to work. I, I think it's the size and scale and speed of growth has confounded my expectations. Um, I think now you have a, a you know, a, a, a bunch of founders out there who've grown up with, you know, the huge successful scaling stories of the of Google or Facebook. Remember when we started this, you know, Facebook's IPO was in the toilet and, you know, people weren't sure whether, you know, that we've had six, seven years of unprecedented technology growth in the public market since then. But um, I was pretty confident it was going to work. Uh, so I'm, I'm Scottish and Scottish people don't generally put money out unless they know they're going to be getting something back. <laughs> I don't, not sure of the cultural context to fully appreciate that, but I have heard all sorts of uh, quips uh, about... Uh, are you yeah, wearing, you are know, you wearing who, Union who, Jack who, who, who sucks? Who invented um, a copper wire? It was two Scottish men arguing over a, a penny, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, they're known for being careful. Excellent. Let's put it that way. And, okay, so, so that makes sense. Saw the opportunity, uh, confident that it was going to work. To, I mean, I guess to, to look at it like, even slightly more te- technically and, and you know, maybe using some kind of geeky, um, you know, almost like you know, investor VC terminology, like f- from a unit economic standpoint, like how much it was going to cost you to acquire customers, uh, how much it was going to cost you to kind of you know, process transactions versus how much you thought you could, um, you could effectively charge for these services and, and how much demand they were be, uh, there would be. Did you, did you spend much time thinking about that in great detail or was it people are always going to want to send money abroad technology allows you to do it better we'll figure it out as we go yeah i'd love to say it was the former but it was really the latter this is a big ass market where people's satisfaction rates are super low the prices that people are getting charged are very high and you know stuff there's a pain point there's a consumer pain point so really i came from a you know just wanting to fix something yeah. for and, and it's something that i knew um uh, affected millions and millions of people around the world. So I kind of like didn't do much more in the way of detailed um, financial or market analysis. Lots of people have done that since, uh, both on this business and the sector as, you know, collectively we've all raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and I'm sure they will continue to do it as, you know, as these market, as these businesses go on to raise more capital and hit the public market. So, but yeah, we started off very simply with a, a pain point that we saw affected lots of people and a belief that technology could, you know, help solve the problem for people. Yeah, so. well, you, you had the advantage of coming from the industry, so I'm sure as, as much of that uh, analysis and insight was gained uh, uh, on, on the ground through the small world experience. Uh, 
Interesting. Um, and then, I mean, I guess, and maybe you didn't think about it, um, you know, in, in a, you know, with, with much kind of, you know, from a tangible standpoint early on, but you know, when, when you, when you think about, and we thought about founding Asimo, or when you think about investing in other fintech businesses, um, I mean, what are your kind of expectations around how much uh, capital is going to be required to build technology and uh, acquire customers uh, prior to the kind of revenue generation really, really kicking in and, and starting to make the business kind of work from a profitability standpoint? So rightly or wrongly, I like businesses where, where you're making money from the word go now you might not be making the money it costs you to acquire the customer back but you've got to be making money and i think um i i i I feel challenged by some of the other businesses in the fintech sector where they're saying you know we're going to get lots of different lots of customers and work out how to monetize them at a different point you know we lose money per customer so every new customer costs people money but at some point we'll be of a scale that we can launch some undefined new products and, and be able to monetize that way that that worries me that's not my kind of like if i'm putting my own dollars in i can you know it's good fun to watch from the sidelines um you know those classic examples are, i guess people like paytm in india or you know even venmo which became part of paypal is a phenomenally successful business but domestic payments business and actually every time a customer uses it, it costs money that you never get back um so i guess i like businesses that start with yeah, start with revenue. Um, I like big markets, you know, big addressable markets. I think that's that's obvious. Um, but most of all, and I think we probably said this last time, I like to see grit in entrepreneurs, you know, because the model is not going to work first time. The people aren't going to work first time. The tech's not going to work first time. And something that you didn't expect is going to hit you from left field, probably right at the point you really need it not to. And as an entrepreneur... You know, you've got to be wanting to get out of bed on those days as well. Mm. So that's for me. It's yeah. I think it's something where you know, financial services is very good and very important to be making money from the word go. Um, particularly, as customers are much more evil, e- easier to chop and change at this point. But bigger markets and then entrepreneurial grit from my own, you know, yeah. it's kind of my own investment style. And there's the, um, but as an angel, you can be, you can be, um, much more instinctive. Mm. Uh, if I was doing it with other people's money, you've got to come up with some reasons. Sure. What if, I'd be curious, what have you found to be the most effective, uh, customer acquisition strategies at, at Asimo? A referral. So a hundred percent. So refer people who've been told either, and we, and we track, we track it two ways. We track digital referral and that's paid referral where both people get rewarded on, on either side. But we also track, where did you first hear about Asimo, uh, which is more sort of sub- subjective question. And, and people will say, I was told by a friend or a relative. And those customers are by far the stickiest, uh, the highest spending, the highest NPS, um, so actually getting referral right transformed our business. And actually the, the one thing that we track incredibly closely on a day by day, week by week, market segment by market segment basis is our net promoter score, our NPS, which is de facto, you know, how likely would you be able to, would you be to recommend this service to someone else? And if our NPS is, is tracking up, um, I think it's at 66 right now, um, which is pretty high actually, um, actually very high for financial services. We're always looking at that. So yeah, in answer to your question, referred customers, people who've heard about you from, from friends, family, other members of their network are, they're, they're much better and it costs less to get them. They stay longer, they spend more money. Um, but I don't think that's unique, you know, of, of course, um, how do you find out about something that will going somewhere you ask a friend and it's, and it's, it's, but that has transformed our business. It's transformed two things. I mean, one is the, the, the cohorts, so the stickiness of the customers, and it's also transformed the the cost of acquiring new customers. Mm-hmm. It took us, you know, it took us years to iterate on before we got it right. Um, and you know, you have to have a product and engineering team who are utterly focused on how do we get that NPS number up. That's interesting. Do, do you think your has the cost of acquisition risen or, or fallen over time? Because you've in, presumably perfected some of the re- referral type stuff, but at the same time, you've maybe kind of grabbed some of the early adopters. 
it's 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 dropped um i don't have the numbers at my fingerprints uh, my fingertips but um uh i think it's dropped by 70 percent over the last 18 months wow. seven zero wow. so you know it's 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 really come down hmm. a lot uh we think that's a couple of things one is the nps still going up one is referral becoming a much more important channel in terms of a percentage of, of customers that we acquire both paid referral and word of mouth referral and i guess we, we're just in the market. So people know about us. We're in the consideration set, you know, and financial services are tough. You know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to have trust, particularly in digital. There's a reason that banks are built of marble and sit on the high street because people know that they're probably going to be there next week when they, when they come back. You don't have that physical element in uh, digital financial services. So, you know, it takes a while to earn that trust with people. Um, and so once people have t- heard about you for, you know, uh, being around for a few years, they, pr- they probably trust that you're going to be around longer. So mm-hmm. I think, yeah, but for us, actually, this was always a decent business, high repeat rate um, and, and very good uh, cost of acquiring customers it's become a fantastic business as we've scaled. Mm. How did you fund the business initially? So like um, super early, like, you know, first super early development Um, of the the myself and myself and Ricky, um, put our hands up. Yeah. Scottish, Scottish guy put his hand in his pocket. Uh, (laughs) And and, um, Ricky Knox, um, my, um, my business partners, you know, uh, now running tandem bank. Yeah. We funded, uh, we funded the business from our, from our own pockets. Mm -hmm. And that's an important lesson because, that first slug of capital, um, if you can afford to do it yourself, is is is, is probably the most expensive money you'll ever raise. Mm. Um, and not only that, anyone who comes along behind you is going to want to know that you have strong conviction. And I know actually our first business, Small World, we had a lot less availability of of, of capital personally. Just you know, a couple of years out of MBA school, grad school, which is super expensive. You know, um, we went in a position to to do that. But this time around, yeah, we funded a big chunk of it ourselves, uh, which, which ultimately means that, you know, own a much more significant part of the business these days. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the, the, you know, the, basically the, the first product or you know, whatever it was that you, that you launched to market that allowed you to start generating some revenue, you, yeah. you basically paid to develop your, your, yourselves. And like, I don't know, how, many, how big was the team? How long did it take to, to actually get um, like, the first product So we product set up the, we founded the business on the 3rd of January um, 2012 we did our first transactions through the stack just two days um, before my son was born brilliant timing Um, so in October so actually to get from you know oh we're going to do something to a functioning uh, I suppose minimum viable product but actually you know in financial services minimum viable tends to be a bit more viable because you're dealing with other people's money and you're regulated and all the rest of it um, took us 10 months wow and how does how does that initial version compare to what you what you have now I mean was it kind of constant iteration was it it's completely I mean, it's, uh, you know when they launch a new car and they go 96 percent new components and you always wonder whether that's true because it looks exactly the same from the outside um i mean it, it, it it's it would be the same it, it's completely new um we i guess the, the 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 basic customer interface is is probably not change that much the three or four buttons that you have to press in to do what we do which is send money but the underlying technology the front end the back ends the way that we build it the data that we take about it the payment methods that we use the partners that we use on the back end everything is different every single thing has been iterated on um and we made some you know i think we had what most people have which is we were pushing very fast to get a minimum viable product out and we made some technology shortcuts that ended up, you know, being quite painful and, and costing us a lot of time further down the road. Um, and w- would you do that differently if you're going to do it again? Uh, it's, it's a difficult yeah, one. Because it sounds because, like getting to market very fast. Yeah, is, getting is to market fast is important. Uh, it's all it's a, it's a trade off between, I guess, capital availability, um, speed to market, whether or not you are, you know, able to to build. And we. we we didn't have the capital to to to, to build it in a, um, in a in a more modular, architected way when we first started. And a minimum viable product probably shouldn't be over over um, 
architect in because you know that you're going to have to change a load of stuff um would i do it differently i potentially would have got more involved personally in the technical architecture mm. this is total honesty here um in, in the early days um but i'm very happy with where we are now yeah. so so it sounds like the the actual kind of service being provided to the to the customer like from, from the customer standpoint it's not hasn't changed all that much since the initial proposition. What has changed is the efficiency, the and presumably the operational cost efficiency on your on your side based on the you know, underlying components. Yeah, well, I mean, we think of it like a flywheel. So you know, if you 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 build a service, you iterate on it to to get. Um, a better customer experience that better customer experience allows you to get more customers at a lower cost more customers allows you to get a bunch of scale economies that then allows you to offer the service at a lower cost uh, that, and, and, and make more revenue that you can then reinvest into good customer service and it kind of like iterates on that that is the that's the, the flywheel and we, we've actually raised quite quite a lot less capital than some of the other people out there um, but we've tried to be really disciplined about just following how do we how do we make it so the service I guess hasn't changed the customers it used to be I think we did 90% of transactions within 24 hours they would arrive for the for the customer I think it now it's 90% within one hour so you know that's quite a distinctive um, change in the, the the customer service we obviously are much more sophisticated in, in the messages that we produce to customers our prices have come down over over time as we've been able to get economies of scale and, and, and negotiate um, and so yeah I suppose it's but yeah ultimately what we've done hasn't changed that yeah. much and, and we've often thought as a management team as senior management team and the rest of the team oh what should we do this or that and you know it's yeah. very like easy you haven't started offering like loans and you know offering suddenly like a, you know a current account equivalent sort of thing like it's, it's not not like you know create some you know, bank replica or something. You've been very focused on at, your specific problem. At this point, we want to be very, very good at doing one, one thing. One thing which is, you know, is a massive market and one thing that is broken. I have aspirations to fix banking, fix insurance, fix lots of other industries. But doing it with this particular venture is 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 probably not the the right way. Mm -hmm. We want to be, you know, there are there are too many things to fix um, in cross border payments. I, I still feel for us to start thinking about those other products and services. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting um, because of the way that fintech businesses are built. They're very modular, um, and they're also built by people with a vision to change stuff. I think you will see more. Uh, commercial tie-ups between different fintechs or traditional financial services and, and fintechs and I think that's all becoming you know quite an exciting interesting place to play and some of them will have money behind them It'll be, you'll see some M&A some of them will be JVs some of them will be purely commercial but there's more and more of that stuff is going to start happening I think it's interesting that you know the financial uh, it took us a long time to get our first banking relationships it took us a very long time to get our first card acquiring relationships um, and in the early days, people were worried about fintech. Then they were laughing at fintech, and now they, you know, desperately trying to run fintech events and, and partner with fintech. So there's been a big cycle in terms of, of how this industry is seen, because there's not a bank CEO out there who hasn't been told, you know, probably multiple times a day that his, you know, unless he embraces technology and starts to change, then he's going to be in trouble. Mm. At what point did you did you know that yeah? that it, it was working, it was gonna work? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I So I think at this point I kinda know it's gonna work, um, but I still, you know, I still have, I, I still feel driven to, to prove it and, and prove myself and the business every, every yeah. day. Um, uh, I, yeah, 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 fair point, let me rephrase the question. At what point did you know that the Initial premise: uh, the 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 economics of, of the model were uh, you know, were were correct, and that you know it, it was just a question of you know kind of scaling. So um, super early, actually, um, before Christmas, we um, we went out to all of our customers, um, and actually we sent them all a, a Christmas card. We didn't have that many, um, and we got some replies and I was actually kind of blown away by the people that actually bother to write back to a company that was providing a financial service um, 
And they said, nice stuff. And I phoned a few of them. Um, and they, they, you know, they, they really loved Asmo. And I'm not saying that everyone who uses it does, um, but a lot of our customers tell us that what we're doing is great. And actually, if you just listen to the customers, um, you know, and, and, and they're telling you that what you're doing is good, that's probably, that, that's kind of when I knew that we were onto something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, capital availability, the ability to scale, um, you know, technology choices, all that came later. But I knew that, you know, the, 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 the basic premise of this, which was to try and build something that was, that was more democratic and use technology to give lots and lots of people better service was going to work, was, was pretty early. And that, 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 that came from, that proof point came from the customers. Yeah. Excellent. Michael Kent, founder and CEO of Asimo, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you liked today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.